All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Monica Lawrence. Um, I'm one of the uh, faculty members of the University of Virginia, and I'd like to welcome you to tonight's um, Clinical Immunology Society Case Conference webinar, which is hosted by the uh, Early uh, Career Immunologists uh, Committee of the CIS. Um, before we get started with um, the two great case discussions that we have for tonight, I just wanted to remind everyone that if there is a case that any of you have that you'd like to present, um, get lots of great suggestions and feedback if it's an unsolved case or just um, share with us a cool case that you have from your practice. We would love um, to have it, so please just email us at the um, address uh, on your screen. Um, and so without um, spending any more time, I just want to um, introduce our first speaker, um, who is uh, Kevin Wu, who's actually a um, medical student uh, at the University of South Florida, and he is going to be presenting um, an interesting discussion about um, arthritis in RAG deficiency with um, some uh, senior mentors, Dr. Jan Walter and Dr. Diana Milankovic. All right, take it away, Kevin. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, as she said, I am a medical student at the University of South Florida, and I work in uh, Dr. Yolan Walter's lab, who is both affiliated with University of South Florida, Morsani College of Medicine, and also John Hopkins All Children's Hospital. And today we'll be discussing clinical challenges in recombination activating gene deficiency and arthritis. Okay, so our first slide, recombination activating gene, or RAG, is the major player in VDJ recombination to generate the TNB cell immune repertoire to fight off infections. Now, I'd like to introduce RAG by going through this figure on the right. Uh, it's a figure in a paper we published with Dr. Luigi Notarangelo in uh, Nature Reviews Immunology. And as you can see at the top right, there are those variable diversity and junctional segments that are rearranged to form, a unique T, uh, to, to form unique T cell and B cell receptor sequences that create immune diversity. So going down, you can see that we have a blow up of recombination activating gene. And there's RAG1 and RAG2 that come together to form a heterotetramer that binds to those recombination signal sequences that flank the V, D, and J segments at the top right. So RAG1 nix one DNA strand to generate a paired complex, and RAG2 stabilizes binding and interacts with DNA. And after additional modifications by players at the bottom right, including Artemis and TDT, which create junctional diversity, the overall diversity of T cell receptors and immunoglobulin repertoire, um, uh, rep repertoires is greatly enhanced. So during our presentation, we'll be discussing disease states in which there are defects in recombination activating gene. Um, normally, both alleles have to be mutated to cause disease. However, one of our patients does have low levels of RAG recombinase activity with a compound heterozygous mutation. We'll get a lot more into the details later. So initially, uh, RAG deficiency was uh, linked to severe combined immunodeficiency, or SCID, and that's on the left. And in this disease, the T and B cell repertoire is absent, uh, and severe infections and failure to thrive occur. Now, later, um, RAG deficiency was actually associated with a spectrum of immune diseases. On the top, you can see it goes from infection all the way to autoimmunity and infl uh, inflammation. And with the more autoimmune phenotypes, you have lobe-preserved RAG recombinase activity. Now, one phenotype in the middle that was described is Omen syndrome. These patients have restricted TNB cells that generate an autoreactive repertoire. And these patients will need bone marrow transplant or else they uh, will die, unfortunately. Uh, in recent years, we have discovered a phenotype called combined immune deficiency with granulomas and autoimmunity. And unlike the other two, skin and Omen syndrome, this can actually occur in pediatric and adult patients. These patients have that lobe-preserved RAG activity, and hence they have low to normal TNB cells, um, but they have a wide variety of autoimmune complications listed there, cytopenias, granulomas, alopecia, myasthenia, uh, myasthenia gravia, uh, gravis, and arthritis. And arthritis in these patients uh, will be the focus of my presentation. 
Okay, so we were um, um, recently submitted a paper uh, with the largest cohort to date of patients with RAC deficiency and autoimmunity. And as you can see, 67% had autoimmune symptoms at the top left. So it's a relatively common feature in RAG deficiency. As you can see in the graph next to it, it's mainly a combined immune deficiency with granulomas and autoimmunity phenotype. Now the top right, we have a graph showing all the different autoimmune complications in RAG deficiency. And you can see that there are many. The most common one by far, 53, um, is, cyto, uh, is the manifestation of autoimmune cytopenias that occurs in more than 60% of patients. However, it should be noted that arthritis is actually relatively rare, and it's not even present in this cohort, but we will be introducing two patients that do have RAG deficiency and arthritis. Bringing your attention to the graph on the bottom, these, pa these patients have a lower chance of receiving bone marrow transplantation. And if they are, they receive bone marrow transplant at a much older age, around six years of age or older on average. And then lastly, on the bottom right, you can see that most patients get hematopoietic stem cell transplantation uh, much later in life after clinical diagnosis. And that in these patients, molecular diagnosis and death occur in close proximity around seven and a half years of age on average. So if we're comparing this population to the uh, rigorous screen and transplant strategy that we have for skid babies, uh, these data suggest that we could be dealing with a population of patients that could be underserved. So as, this, as uh, arthritis is the focus of my presentation today, I wanted to highlight arthritis in the context of primary immune deficiencies. Arthritis arises in many primary immunodeficiencies uh, through mechanisms that involve immune dis dysregulation. For example, on the B-cell side, large cohorts of patients with X-linked A-gamma globulinemia and common variable immune deficiency had patients uh, with arthritis. You can see the percentages on the right. And on the bottom, uh, T-cell regulatory pathology is also um, linked to arthritis in three major cohorts, including patients with LRBA deficiency, CTLA-4 deficiency, and STAT-3 gain-of-function mutations. Lastly, in the green circle, inflammatory arthritis has been associated with combined immune deficiency syndromes, such as in patients with wiscott algid syndrome, ZAP-70 deficiency, and Nemehan breakage syndrome. So we would like to highlight an emerging association between RAG and arthritis. Patients with RAG deficiency have been known to have T-regulatory defects and also are part of a combined immune deficient phenotype shown by these red arrows. It is possible that the immunological background in RAG deficiency then can be promoting arthritis. Currently, treatment of arthritis is quite complicated. For example, first-line disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, or DMARDs, as monotherapy is actually only sufficient for one-third of patients with arthritis. Um, they generally go towards second-line therapies, such as TNF-alpha inhibitors and IL-1 and IL-6 blockade, and more biologic targets are shown in the bottom right. Um, importantly, the treatment of, of arthritis in the general population is not immune mechanism-based. So the decision to choose one drug over another drug is based on evidence from previous clinical trials and isn't adjusted based on the immune phenotype of the patient. In contrast, in patients with primary immune deficiencies, we we'll need to balance the benefits of immunomodulating therapies, selecting this therapy, with the potential of increasing susceptibility to infection. So in this population, careful selection of therapy based on immune background is definitely needed. Our presentation will focus on two patients with RAG deficiency and arthritis complications, um, and these are from, the ad from adult and pediatric populations. Uh, patient A is a 39-year-old female from the United Kingdom. She was part of a very recent study on adults with RAG deficiency, and this study is novel because RAG deficiency in the first slide, as I said before, is associated as a, it's usually a pediatric disease, but we're finding more and more that this can actually manifest in adults as well. Patient B is a five-year-old female from Bulgaria and represents a pediatric case of this disease. So here's a figure um, showing patient A's clinical phenotype. Uh, and we'll start from left to right um, on the time, starting with um, her autoimmune system symptoms and the um, 
her adolescent years, including vitiligo at age 20, uh, and then alopecia later on, and she still needs to wear a wig for this, unfortunately, today. Later on in the light green, she developed chronic lung disease and bronchiectasis during this time. And then additional autoimmune diseases would emerge, such as myasthenia gravis and intermittent episodes of autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Uh, when we did phenotyping, uh, or when the clinicians did phenotyping on this patient, it showed an IgG deficiency without a deficiency in IgM or IgA. So a diagnosis of probable combined variable immune deficiency was or common variable immune deficiency was made at the top. And then at age 28 in the green, she presented with restriction in movement of joints and a synovial fluid analysis one was done and that was negative for inflammatory cells. And a muscle biopsy confirmed that this was indeed macrophagic myofasciitis. She would continue to have joint pain and at age 33 after multiple uh, relapses, another synovial fluid analysis was repeated on her right knee and this demonstrated inflammatory cells supporting the diagnosis in red of inflammatory arthritis. So going down to the treatment section, uh, she was initially treated with methotrexate and steroids and uh, later on sulfasalazine was added, but this all had a suboptimal response at first. Um, she was escalated to an anti-IL-1 and anti-TNF-alpha biologics. However, this continued to have a suboptimal response. And finally, at age 34, she was placed on tocilizumab. This is an anti-IL-6 biological agent, and this actually resulted in complete remission of her joint-related symptoms. And she has been in remission for the past five years after starting tocilizumab. More, on, more about tocilizumab later in this presentation. Uh, patient A was enrolled in the 2018 Bridge study on genetic defects shortly after, and sequencing revealed a compound heterozygous RAG2 mutation. So I'll go ahead and explain that now. Here's a table of immunological data on patient A, and at the top left, you can see that she had a compound heterozygous RAG mutation, and this caused a RAG recombinase activity to be low but preserved. Um, going down the table, you can see that her um, phenotype was notable for progressive B cell loss and a very low fraction of naive T cells at 5%, which is much lower than normal. And this supports a general combined immune deficient phenotype. Other panels on the right revealed antibodies targeting uh, acetylcholine receptor, skeletal muscle, uh, and these were evidence of myasthenia gravis. And then also high levels of rheumatoid factor, which helped diagnose inflammatory arthritis in this patient. In addition, at the bottom left, antibodies targeting cytokines interferon alpha and IL-12 were also present. And we have a paper recently that shows that anti-interferon alpha can be pathognomonic for RAG deficiency and can be used as a biomarker, uh, biomarker to diagnose that. So together, based on this immunological phenotype and reduced recombination activity, the combined immune deficient phenotype was established for patient A. Going on to patient B, patient B is a much younger patient. She's five-year-old from Bulgaria, and she had multiple gastrointestinal and upper respiratory infections starting at four months of age. At 16 months of age, after a, an MMR vaccination, she was hospitalized with fever, rash, swelling of the legs and fingers. And at first, there was a concern for Kawasaki's disease. However, the onset of arthritis symptoms and the presence of autoantibodies, for which I'll show later, uh, made, us, uh, made the clinicians concerned for um, systemic lupus erythematosus, for which she fulfilled WH class of, uh, WHO classification criteria for. And there's also concern for macrophagic activation syndrome. Um, in her clinical history, she was finally diagnosed with macrophagic activation syndrome, and she was successfully treated with corticosteroids. Interestingly, her arthritis symptoms were also well controlled with steroids and first-line therapies like hydroxychloroquine. Her history of recurrent infections and hospitalizations raised suspicion for primary immune deficiency. So we did a workup or the clinicians did a workup. And the first thing to note is at the top right, um, testing of the cord blood revealed T cell rece uh, receptor excision circles were undetectable at zero. 
This led her clinicians to search for skid-related defects, and they revealed a RAG1 mutation with a very low recombination activity of 1.4%. Patient B had T and B cell lymphopenia and a low fraction of T cells of only three point, uh, naive T cells of only 3.6 to 5.8%. And this should be around 80% for uh, uh, normally for her age. Uh, she also has hypergamma globulinemia, high IgG levels, um, indicative of her inflammatory symptoms. On the right, she has a broad autoantibody profile, including many antibodies associated with lupus, like anti-double-stranded DNA, and uh, anti-cytokine antibodies are still pending on this patient. So overall, due to her mixed lupus and systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis-like presentation, a diagnosis of Stills disease should be considered. It's a rare type of inflammatory arthritis that classically has fever, rash, and joint pain. And it can, this can occur in pediatric patients. Uh, but overall, due to her immunological phenotype and reduced RAG recombination activity, we concluded that she has combined immunodeficiency phenotype. Okay. So when thinking about the significance of these two patient cases, we should consider what makes the arthritis in these patients different from typical arthritis. And for one, the clinical presentation is diverse, involving multiple autoimmune disorders. Uh, contra contrary to one's intuition, the presence of multiple autoimmune disorders can be indicative of immune dysregulation, and that could be caused by primary immune deficiency. Uh, clinicians should also pay attention to certain immunological lab values when treating arthritis. A low fraction of naive T cells can easily be investigated for using flow cytometry, and low, level, low, low levels can in, uh, be indicative of a combined immune deficiency, specifically the presence of anti-cytokine antibodies such as anti-interferon alpha can narrow down the uh, diagnosis down to RAG deficiency, and we've shown that this can be a biomarker for RAG deficiency. Lastly, arthritis can, be, uh, can respond to treatment differently and underlying immune disorders. Patient A was refractory to treatment, and patient B developed lupus-related syndrome. So patients with RAG deficiency and arthritis may be more refractory to treatment and have higher risk of infection after treatment. Similarly, we observed that autoimmune cytopenia in our cohort of RAG deficient patients were more uh, severe and more refractory to treatment as well. So there are some parallels in the literature. As reviewed before, patient A experienced remarkable recovery in her arthritis after starting tocilizumab that causes an anti-IL-6 um, blockade. Recent, um, the indications for tocilizumab include um, uh, chronic inflammatory arthritis in adults and patients who fail those first-line therapies. An interesting point is that tocilizumab confers equal or less risk for infections when compared to other biologics. So this could be an ideal choice for patients with uh, risk for infection, like primary immunodeficient patients. Recently, tocilizumab was also a successful example of therapy that's based, uh, that was selected based on immune background. So in one of these studies, uh, they, they showed that IL-6 is one of the primary cytokines that utilizes STAT-3 for signal transduction. And in a cohort of patients with primary immune deficiency and STAT-3 gain of function mutations, one patient also had arthritis that was refractory to all treatment. And upon starting tocilizumab, um, a complete remission of arthritis occurred that was similar to what happened in our patient. So the role and source of IL-6 in our RAG patients is unclear, but as our patient also experienced this remission after IL-6 treatment, there might be some implication on uh, treatment options. Um, patient B also had a systemic form of inflammation that could be IL-6 responsive if it recurs in the future as well. So we suggest that the IL-6 pathway should be better defined in RAG deficiency to be able to pursue it as a possible treatment option in the future. Um, alternatively, other mechanisms of immune dysregulation in RAG deficiency also overlap with arthritis pathogenesis and could be evaluated. Uh, for example, Dr. Henderson in the Notarangelo group showed that when Tregs were sampled from the joints of arthritis patients, they were found to have an abnormal Treg repertoire. And also Roe with the Notarangelo group showed that RAG deficient patients had abnormal T regulatory cell repertoires. So therefore, abnormal regulatory T cells could be a source promoting autoimmunity, such as arthritis, in RAG deficient patients. 
So what can we learn from the cases presented today? Um, our first reported case was a rupus uh, SLE patient with refractory erosive arthritis that had low receptor editing and a pathogenic heterozygous RAG deficiency. Um, we have added to these two with two new cases of RAG deficiency with rheumatic complications. Uh, case A was a bona fide rheumatoid arthritis in an adult, and case B was a mild arthritis in a five-year-old with systemic MAS and lupus-like presentation. Tocilizumab was successful in treating case A, raising the possibility that IL-6 might be uh, driving the inflammation um, in this disease. So to sum, it up, our uh, to sum it up, our major takeaway is that clinicians should, taking care of patients with chronic arthritis and other atypical conditions should consider exploring for underlying immune abnormalities such as RAG deficiency, especially when arthritis occurs in combination with many other autoimmune disorders. Okay, so that concludes my lecture portion of the series, so we can move on to discussion now. Thank you for your attention during this time. Thanks, Kevin. That was wonderful. Um, before we um, move on to uh, the remarks by the, um, Kevin's senior uh, mentors, Dr. Walter and Dr. Milojevic, I would like to invite um, any attendees who um, have questions or who have comments to just go ahead and send them through on the attendee chat, and then um, we can uh, get our senior discussants and Kevin's thoughts on those. But um, while you guys are sending in your questions, I'll let... Um, let Dr. Uh, Walter or um, whoever would like to go ahead first. Oh, Kevin, great job. And um, we are very excited to share this uh, study with you because we felt it was an atypical presentation for like deficiency, but also eye-opening um, with the response to the solizumab. So I don't know how many of the attendees are rheumatologists, but we are really eager to hear uh, their thoughts on it. And uh, Dr. Milojevic is here with us today, who is the chief of rheumatology in our hospital. So I'm going to let her to reflect a little bit on, on uh, this uh, information. Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is Diana Milojevic, and I'm a rheumatologist. And I'll start uh, with the last paragraph of uh, Kevin's presentation that clinicians taking care of patients with chronic arthritis and other atypical uh, conditions should consider exploring for underlying immune abnormalities. Rheumatologists usually come from the clinical part of, of, of uh, uh, patients' presentations. Really, what's important for us is to know typical chronic arthritis presentations. We know that arthritis, typical uh, uh, arthritis in lupus, uh, is very different from arthritis uh, 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 found in juvenile idiopathic arthritis or rheumatoid arthritis seropositive, which goes with erosions, as opposed to seronegative arthritis and uh, and those are, again, very different from what we call systemic onset juvenile idiopathic arthritis or Stills disease in adults. So for us, whenever we see atypical uh, clinical presentation, um, I think we always think that there um, may be something else uh, going on. It is very, for example, unusual to find many auto autoimmune manifestations in a child with typical juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So um, the question, however, in my mind is how much of laboratory um, uh, screening should we be doing at the very beginning when we see these patients? And I don't think that's a standard of practice. And um, I think these cases will be very instructive uh, in that sense, basically uh, reminding the, the clinicians that if they find more than um, what they expect in a, a, a typical presentation uh, of uh, childhood arthritis, that we should be exploring further and moving away from, from impression or, or, or uh, past knowledge uh, uh, that immune deficiencies present 
with the history of repeated infections. We now see that they can; these patients can present late and um, can present with uh, dominant autoimmune, autoimmune uh, manifestations. So just following up on very quickly on Diana's comments, we have seen it with these two cases that one of the patients, patient A, had low immunoglobulins before immunotherapy by patient B, who had an earlier onset disease and even lower recombination activity, had very high immunoglobulin levels. So just checking basic immunoglobulin levels will not help the clinicians. I, I truly believe on in checking naive memory and memory T-cell compartments and the ratio, and my fellows are probably laughing because they know that we want to test it on many of our patients. But it's a very easy test, CD45 RARO, and it can take you far in picking out patients who have a um, combined immune deficient background. That's a great pearl, um, Dr. Walter. Um, I want to um, get our audience involved here. Um, we have a comment from the audience from one of our pediatric rheumatologists, um, uh, Dr. Gorelick, who is commenting about um, maybe being a little cautious as divining these patients as lupus-like, um, especially patient B, given um, the normal complement and also questioning um, why your patient's responding as nicely to IL-6 blockade, whereof um, most lupus patients in his experience don't. Do either of you have comments about that? Yeah, so the patient that responded to the solitumab was not lupus-like. It was an inflammatory arthritis. And if you would go back, I don't know if you can go back easily on the slides to the arthritis presentation. Kevin, can you do that? Can you go back on the slide? The first patient. Yes. Yeah, very quickly, if we go back to here, uh, you can see that the arthritis was symmetric, affecting the knees, no small joints, and non erosive So there were no indication in the first patient of lupus, and the arthritis was more consistent with what type of arthritis is that, Diana? Well, uh, non erosive arthritis um, can be part of uh, uh, seronegative uh, RA-like arthritis, but also uh, arthritis in lupus is non-erosive. What I find interesting in this patient is that um, uh, this patient had several autoantibodies uh, present on, uh, on top and above uh, positive rheumatoid factor. And double stranded DNA, I believe, was positive. Right? Mighty, yes, actually, it was, uh, it was normal. normal. Oh, it was normal. Right. So, had several autoantibodies present. Um, Anti IL 6 is a well established therapy in, uh, in, in childhood uh, polyarticular juvenile idiopathic arthritis, rheumatoid factor positive and negative. And indeed, we don't. Treat uh, lupus patients with anti IL six um, medication, but I, uh, I, uh, I think this is what I find interesting here is that all these uh, uh, autoimmune manifestations, such as autoimmune hemolytic anemia, which we find associated very frequently associated with lupus, in this patient suggest kind of lupus like picture, but this patient obviously responded well to. Until six patients, I don't think that we understand yeah. why. Uh, I think lupus light was just basically clean, clean clinical impression. impression. Yeah. And I agree with Dr. Mark Gorelick as he's mentioning that uh, it is uh, it, these patients are very unique, so we can't really label them. Yeah. And uh, we agree with that. That it's a very mixed mishmash, and um, maybe that's what could be um, an eye opening. Um, presentation to the rheumatologist that they are really not fitting into the typical boxes to consider a different disease. Um, Dr. Uh, Walter, before we run out of time, I want to get to Victoria's question because um, it's one I have too, which is where, um, other than, is your lab um, running anti-interferon alpha assays or do you know um, other labs that run that? And um, how good of a screening tool um, have you found that to be? So there are several laboratories in the United States that run anti-cytokine antibodies. Uh, Steve Holland and his team has CLIA-approved 
testing for anti-interferon comma and some of the interferon, other interferon antibodies. So you can definitely call, contact with them if you want to do it on clinical grounds. We have seen at uh, last CIS uh, that there's a group at National Jewish who is interested in doing these assays. And we also do it in our laboratory. So any of these teams can be contacted if you are interested and we can test these, um, these antibodies um, for you. Perfect. Okay, well, um, unless there's other last points that anyone wants to make, um, I want to make sure we get to our second um, case. Um, so I'll, I'll give it just a minute. But if there are questions um, uh, from attendees, um, if you can leave them in the chat box, I'm sure our presenters would be more than happy to um, chat back and forth with you about it. Um, but um, in the interest of time, I think I'll probably just thank um, all of you for presenting. Uh, that is a fascinating um, story, and I'm sure there's a lot more to develop from it. So thanks so much. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and so then we're going to move on in kind of keeping the theme of um, unusual presentations of um, of immune deficiency. Um, we have a case uh, presented by uh, Dr. Yasmin Khan from Vanderbilt on the humoral side of the George syndrome. And her senior mentor is Dr. Elisa Kobrinsky. Um, so go ahead. Thanks, Monica. Good evening, everyone. Um, Morgan, I can't see my slides. Can you guys see them? They, I can see them now, okay. Yasmin. Here they are, here they are. Okay. Um, so this case is not at all a diagnostic dilemma, but it has been a little bit of um, sort of a treatment dilemma for me. And so I hope that everyone will have thoughts on how, how to move forward. Um, so our patient is a four-year-old female with 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, also known as DeGeorge syndrome, which was confirmed by fish analysis at birth. She's currently admitted for treatment of pneumonia. Um, we were consulted to come and see her during her hospital admission. Um, at that time, it was her third admission in, in that calendar year, and it was only July. Um, her previous admission was in the PICU, requiring some increased respiratory support with CPAP, and that was in May, so um, a little more than two months prior. When we interviewed her mom, she said, you know, she's had so many diagnoses of pneumonia. I think this is probably number 17. Most of them have been chest x-ray confirmed. She's also had multiple ear infections. And even the, you know, the previous winter, she'd been diagnosed with flu four times, had multiple upper and lower respiratory tract infections, multiple ear infections. And her mom estimated that she's on antibiotics at least monthly the entire year around, sometimes twice a month during the winter. Um, her past medical history is really significant, you know, for DeGeorge. She had tetralogy of Fallot with pulmonary stenosis, had a complete repair at age two months. She really didn't have any history of hypocalcemia. She was on calcium supplementation for a short time after she had cardiac surgery as an infant. She's had frequent infections, as I mentioned previously. She has some of the speech delay and behavioral issues that can be common in patients with DeGeorge. And she has had um, PE tubes twice and both times had um, adenoidectomy. Her social history is pretty unremarkable. She lives with both parents and two older siblings that are both in high school. She's in pre-K, planning to start kindergarten in the fall, um, and lives in a non-smoking home with no pets. She is on ranitidine for acid suppression, um, on Flovent two puffs twice a day, and currently on ceftriaxone for treatment of presumed community-acquired pneumonia. She doesn't have any exciting family history. Her mom gets frequent sinus infections. Um, both her parents were tested, but neither have the mutation that the patient inherited. Her two older siblings are healthy, and she has no known members, family members with immunodeficiency. Um, on her previous admission, she got hooked up with our pulmonary team, and they started her on some low-dose inhaled corticosteroid um, to think about whether or not she has sort of an asthma phenotype and if, if treating that would, would help her pneumonia frequency. 
She had a swallow study that was negative for aspiration, but they put her on ranitidine for possible reflux component to her sort of chronic wet sounding cough. She had been lost to follow up to our clinic, but had been seen in the DeGeorge Specialty Clinic at CHOP a little bit earlier that month and had a great laboratory evaluation then. Um, but looking back in our chart, we knew that at birth she had a normal T-cell count and then again at age three. She was seen again in our clinic at age three, not for immunology follow-up, but for allergy evaluation to think about if that was part of her frequent infections. So her lab evaluation at CHOP um, showed that she had pretty normal um, T cell counts. You can see her CD3 count was almost 2000. CD4 count was about 1100 with a normal CD45 RO and RA distribution. She had a normal CD8 count, normal CD1920 and NK cells. Um, her hematocrit was 34.7, her white count was 4.3, and her platelets were a little low at 75. That was unusual for her and, and normalized on subsequent checks. Her IgG was 427. Her age-adjusted reference ranges are in the parentheses next to the, um, her levels. So she, her IgG was low, her IgM was low, and IgA was normal. Um, she had some vaccine titers drawn as well, um, and she had three out of 14 serotypes of strep pneumo that were tested, that were protected. Um, 11 of these were found in Prevnar 13, which she had received, although her vaccination history was incomplete. So overall, she had 22% protected, or um, just of the ones in Prevnar, 27% protected. Um, and her tetanus titer was a little bit low per CHOP's reference range at 0.11. Um, they consider it protective if it is above 0.15. So our next steps, um, we re-immunized her with Prevnar and with DTaP because in looking back, we found that um, her vaccination history was incomplete, as I mentioned. And she really had an excellent response to both of those vaccines um, with 12 out of 12 serotypes that we tested increasing two to fourfold. Um, her tetanus and diphtheria became protective and her repeat IgG was 731. So well within the range of normal for her age. Her IgA stayed normal, IgM stayed low. And we sent some B cell phenotyping that was pretty unremarkable. It showed a slight increase in transitional B cells, but otherwise she had normal um, naive memory and switched memory B cells. So at this point, we were thinking, okay, we have some time. We'll immunize her with Pneumovax and see what her um, pure polysaccharide response looks like. But she got admitted again for pneumonia in September, um, very shortly after we had gotten her repeat vaccine titers. So at that point, we gave her a dose of IVIG and started her on monthly infusions. And she's remained on monthly IVIG for the past three years. Um, her infection frequency has improved tremendously. She's had no further episodes of pneumonia. In the past three years, she's been on antibiotics only two to three, two, three times, which is a huge improvement for her. And she's had many, many less missed school days. So every time we have to talk her insurance into letting us continue her IVIG, I sort of look to see, you know, what is new out there in the literature is how much is known about the, the antibody deficiency or humoral side of DeGeorge. And there really isn't a ton out there. And that is why I wanted to present this case and talk about it. So there's one great paper. Um, that I will highlight some of the findings um, in the next couple of slides. Um, there are several case reports that sort of describe different B-cell type immunodeficiencies in DeGeorge syndrome. Patients have been described to have CVID-like disease, IgA deficiency, IgM deficiency, and impaired vaccine responses, and can have some changes in their B-cell maturation, either you know, lower naive or unswitched memory or unswitched B cells or lower switched memory B cells. And in the beginning, when this patient was seen at CHOP, oh, look, this is awesome. Um, 
you ever did that, that's great. Um, when the patient was seen at CHOP, she really f sort of fit the CVID diagnostic criteria because she had low IgG, low IgM, and some impaired vaccine responses. But she boosted well with Prevnar and with DTaP. And when we rechecked her IgG, it was within range for age, although her IgM has stayed normal. In the, in the paper that I'm referencing, they looked at patients who have the diagnosis of DeGeorge syndrome in the USID net um, and ESID registries, and then patients who were seen at CHOP and Emory. And they found that about 19% of all the patients in the, um, in the registries and in, at CHOP and Emory had an IgG of less than 500. About 6.2% of those patients were over the age of three, and about 56 of those patients were over the age of five. And overall, about 2 to 3% of, of those patients were on IVIG. So it's certainly the minority of patients with DeGeorge who, who require some immunoglobulin support. Um, so that brings up the question for me, you know, sort of what are the endpoints of therapy for this patient? She's done so well from an, an infectious perspective while being on monthly IVIG that I'm really hesitant to change anything. And her monthly pre-IVIG troughs have ranged from about 790 up to about 900. So they're not dramatically rising, um, you know, indicating that she's making more IgG on her own. She's continued to have low IgM, but really normal IgA and normal T and B cell counts. So I always question how will I know when to stop it or to or to give her a break. And at some point, um, should we be thinking about trials of IVIG in other patients who have DeGeorge syndrome, who have frequent illnesses, but sort of semi-normal labs like this patient has? So I will really appreciate all of your thoughts and, and um, certainly Dr. Kaprinsky's thoughts. Marie, thanks so much, yes, and I think that's um, a very thought-provoking slide that you end on. Um, I'd love to hear audience um, participation. I apologize that I um, started the poll before you were done talking, but I'm going to start this poll for everyone to um, give Yasmin some advice. And then while you all are voting, um, I'll let um, in invite Dr. Kabrinsky if she wants to kind of weigh in on her experience in seeing patients like this. Thank you, and thank you, Yasmin, for a, a nice illustrative case of some of the difficulties that we find in these patients. And now, as you know, this is a very heterogeneous syndrome, and of course, you see kids with all sorts of problems, uh, various congenital defects, as well as differences in immunity. And of course, one of the problems here is that the degree of T cell deficiency in no way correlates with this problem with antibody deficiencies. And we know that their, so their immune defects appear to be much more broader and more subtle than what we've appreciated previously. Now, you, you highlighted at least that one series that showed that um, there may have been some issues with B cell maturation. And in fact, that it's been repeated in several other smaller studies that showed that the proportion of class switched uh, or and non-class switched memory B cells was reduced in these patients. And I think that's an important point because we often don't do flow cytometry looking for um, specific uh, B cell maturation markers. And that may be helpful sometimes when you have normal or near normal immunoglobulins. And the other issue is in terms of the development of sort of affinity maturation antibodies. So you did get, she did get Prevnar, and of course this is giving a uh, T cell independent boost to the, um, the pneumococcal antibody titers. And that's not really reflective of pure uh, marginal zone B cell responses, which is what might be defective in some of these patients. So giving Pneumovax or a pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine is probably going to be the most helpful. However, we've noted in a number of our patients that they may make good initial responses to a boost with the polysaccharide vaccine, but they don't hang on to those antibodies. So in 12 months, they have dropped their antibody titer to non-protective levels, which 
speaks a little bit to the affinity maturation of their B cell pool. And maybe that is partly responsible for some of the increased infections that we see in some of these patients. So in your case, you did the things that we would normally recommend, which is you know, getting a good idea of what her infections are, but also ruling out other underlying issues. So we know that in DeGeorge syndrome, they frequently have sinus infections, ear infections, and many of those we ascribe to anatomic abnormalities. And she had tubes placed and that probably helped with the ears. And you did a swallowing study and that ruled out aspiration, which can also be an issue because some of these kids will have problems with swallowing as well. And so when you rule out those other features, then you do have to think about, well, what else is going on potentially that could cause her to have pneumonias? And of course, you know, we always have to rule out other things like reactive airway disease, but also any sort of airway malformations, which are not as frequent in 22Q deletion syndrome, but can be seen. And so we would generally recommend getting a CT scan of the chest to make sure we don't have any of those underlying abnormalities. But that being said, once you rule out underlying abnormalities and other reasons for them to have those illnesses, then you have to decide, well, how am I going to manage this kid? And granted, she was relatively young when she <clears throat> presented. She was three years of age. And so we've seen this in other children who don't have DeGeorge syndrome. For example, children who have trisomy 21 or have CHARGE syndrome. And so there might be some commonality there in that maybe they also have a similar problem in maturation of their B cells in that when they're younger, they are more susceptible to infection. And then it frequently gets better as they get older. So speaking in, in large regard to your, your final questions is, well, what do you do with this child after she's done really well in a trial of IBIG? You know, the, the, the issue is we don't know how long they're really going to need it for. And I think we take our cue from what we do with other kids, kids who seem to have maturational problems in their B cells who get much better on gamma globulin. But then after three, four years, we start to give them a break and we take them off of it for a period of time and observe them. So in the in the scope of evaluating these patients, we treat them as any other child who presents to us with a possible humoral antibody deficiency and doing the labs that were done, immunoglobulin, specific antibody titers, both pre and post vaccination, as well as a B cell phenotyping panel by flow cytometry. And then you have if you, if you see that there's a, an abnormality, obviously if they have primary hypogammaglobin anemia, well, then the, the issue is very clear. But if they do not, then you could do a trial of antibiotic prophylaxis, and that's been suggested in several series, and sometimes can be quite beneficial. And if that fails to improve their infections, then a trial of gamma globulin therapy is quite reasonable now. Now you can really, really start, we can start to have an argument and see with our poll how long people think that trial should be. Some people would say one year or two years, and other people would say it takes a little bit longer than that. I personally like to see them get through kindergarten and first grade mm -hmm. without many infections before I think about stopping the gamma globulin to see how they do. Um, but that being said, just anecdotal experiences that some of the kids continue to need gamma globulin replacement up until third, fourth, and fifth grade in, other, in order to be able to come off of it with reasonable success and not have frequent illnesses. And of course, all of this is mitigated on the precept that she doesn't have significant underlying lung damage from her recurrent pneumonias, which is always an issue. And so a CT scan of the chest is very important because if one notes that the child has already developed bronchiectasis as a result of these pneumonias, then the treatment strategies have to be reassessed. So I, we don't, there is no clear answer, as you state. There has been various small trials looking at patients or at least looking for their immune defects, but there are very, very, very few, if not no um, reports of 
IVIG therapy as a trial and when or if it should be stopped. So I look forward to hearing what the uh, attendees have to say about this subject. Thank you. Thanks for that great um, discussion, Dr. Corbinci. Um, I, I, I'll just comment that I think the questions and the um, thought process that you're kind of going through is exactly the same one that we go through all the time with patients with these um, milder, milder humoral immune deficiencies. So I think even though we're talking about DeGeorge here, um, the same thought process could probably apply to lots of different um, conditions. So um, I will start with the poll results and then I'll um, ask the audience while I'm going through the poll results if anybody has a patient with 22Q who they have on IVIG. Um, can you um, feel free to speak up and um, share with us what you did? Um, uh, did you did you do it um, through kindergarten and first grade? Did you um, do a longer trial? Does anyone still have folks on it and how are they doing? Um, but while you're sharing that, um, so um, Yasmin, your votes are um, for uh, the majority of people want you to keep it going. Um, okay, great. So 15% um, uh, say to continue indefinitely, 54% say continue until she's a bit older, and then 31% um, wants you to stop in the spring, but no one wants you to stop now. So hopefully that will help um, a little bit. <laughs> I think um, there's a there's one question. Um, it looks like Dr. Fatima Khan is asking us, right. "Do I have subclasses?" Um, and I did. I do not. We only had a total IgG. What were you thinking so, with that, um, Dr. Um, or or Fatima? Were you thinking about subclass deficiency with um, potential specific antibody deficiency, or um, what was your no, ah, insurance a, a way to convince the insurance. Perfect. And that's yes. so funny. They did ask, actually ask me for it. Yeah, I will for say that the literature, does, the literature does not support that there is evidence of subclass deficiencies. I think there was one IgA deficient patient who had an IgG2 subclass deficiency that was associated in only one series of patients out of Europe. So, Yasmin, can you share with us how hard was it to get this approved initially? Do you think it was easy for you since you had a low G and a low um, a low M? You just called it kind of, did you call it CVID or what did you call this? I called it, it hypogam, um, you know, just general hypogammaglobulinemia. Um, and, it, you know, it did not get approved at first and it ended up needing sort of a peer-to-peer -peer and then an appeal. Um yeah. Because their argument was patients with DeGeorge have T cell deficiency, not B cell deficiency. Um, so it took a little bit of work, but ultimately it got approved. And then her frequency of hospitalization has improved so much that that has helped our, um, our repeat discussions. Okay. Uh, does anyone, I, I'm not seeing anything in the audience from anyone else that has experience um, with this um, in any of their 22 cues. So um, kind of in keeping with what you were saying, uh, maybe there's not enough um, literature, not enough being, uh, it's not thought up enough, but um, Carl Yu wants to know why aren't we calling it specific antibody deficiency given the low tetanus and pneumococcal antibody response? I didn't call it that because by the time we were giving her IVIG, she had had conjugate boosters and had boosted really well. Um, and so I've, I figured that they would request those records and see that she had normal responses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is Dr. Grinsky. I would just say that in, in general, in these patients, you can boost them with Pneumovax, which will give you a boost even in the Prevnar serotypes, which is not reflective of specific polysaccharide or B cell or T cell independent B cell responses, but it will give you at least a boost to those serotypes, but it will also allow you to look at the other serotypes and you can measure all 23 serotype specific antibodies which sometimes can be helpful when you're trying to show that there is some specific antibody defect here. 
Yeah, and another thing that I like to do, I don't know how many people in the audience have um, uh, adopted the Typhi polysaccharide vaccine, um, but um, the salmonella and Typhi vaccine mm-hmm. is something that um, I've been using in my practice for uh, folks who are already on immunoglobulin replacement because the titers aren't present in, uh, at least in U.S. Um, immunoglobulin products, and so you can test their response mm-hmm. Uh, while on treatment. And so um, one suggestion I might make is if you could get that um, approved um, at your institute, then you Mm -hmm. could try um, in terms of knowing when to stop, you could consider vaccinating her. And if she had a normal response, feeling a little bit better about her um, uh, ability to mount a polysaccharide response at least. Right. That's a good thought. Can I ask you where you get the salmonella, salmonella typhi vaccine from? Because most pediatricians would not carry that. We order it and we stock it, and it's about $115 per vaccine. Um, but um, the, and insurance frequently does not cover it, and so we just warn patients up front that with the, you know, the university markup, they're going to pay about $200 out of pocket for the mm-hmm. vaccine. Um, and then we send the titers to... Uh, to the Medical College of Wisconsin lab, to, to Jack Rudis and John Verbsky's, uh, James Verbsky's lab. Does their insurance typically cover the tighter portion or not? I've been doing it for about two years. I have not heard a patient say that they have not gotten that paid for. And I've gotten okay. insurances to pay for IVIG um, based on that. Based I on just that. call it anti-polysaccharide antibody deficiency. I don't know if I clarify which vaccine I use because I don't want to confuse them. Um, uh, Carl also wants to know, could this be an antibody half-life problem, kind of like the memory phenotype of specific Mm -hmm. antibody deficiency, even though I know that's controversial. So what are your all thoughts about this in your patient? So it's difficult to measure, to to show that that's exactly what the problem is here. Now, there there was one paper uh, several years ago by uh, Tony Bonilla and his uh, uh, people looking at avidity maturation of these antibodies, suggesting that maybe there were differences in the, uh, the, va- the antibodies that are produced by the conjugate vaccine versus the polysaccharide vaccine. But that's not been studied in larger groups. And I don't know that anybody has looked at that in terms of the half-life of the antibodies to the vaccine. We know in general that the polysaccharide antibodies um, that are generated by the polysaccharide vaccine are not as long-lived as those generated by the conjugate vaccine. And that's expected because of the the T-cell help that you have for the conjugate vaccines. Um, Normally we tell people you can give a pneumovax every three to five years which is different from our conjugate vaccines where generally 10 years and you expect to continue to see antibodies. But in young kids, even with a conjugate vaccine, the antibodies frequently wane by the time they're four or five years of age. So, you know, it may not hold as true in younger kids. Um, Yasmin, are there any other um, questions or um, discussion points that you wanted to bring up um, in terms of uh, your patient or um, anything before we close? We have about one minute before we hit the hour. I don't think so. I really appreciate everyone's thoughts. Thank you so much, Dr. Kabrinsky, for all that discussion. Yeah, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for both of you. And thanks to the audience for attending. Um, We really appreciate you all being here on your uh, Tuesday evening. And um, we look forward to hosting another webinar next month. Um, Again, if you have any cases, don't be shy. Feel free to um, submit them, and we'd be glad to get you into a webinar coming up soon. Thanks. Thank you. you. Bye-bye.